billions and billions of dollars, uh, how much money is Israel going to give to the United Nations or other facilities or other organizations that it trusts to help in the rebuilding of Gaza? Thank mm. you. It's not without precedent, by the way. In, in the Six-Day War, um, Israel blew up a s big chunk of the city of Kokia in the West Bank and then turned around and rebuilt it uh, in areas where that have, are no longer perceived as hostile or presenting a threat, Israel has been engaged in reconstruction. Not consistently and not without you know, serious departures from that policy. They have been. If Gaza were under a different leadership tomorrow, if al-Fatah were to come back, the PA to restore its authority in Gaza, I think Israel would be involved in the reconstruction effort. Right now, there's a very thorny problem of how you can reconstruct the civilian areas of Gaza and not restore Hamas to its pre uh, operation strength. Very thorny. And it, uh, um, I, don't, I don't have a ready answer for it. But I don't think Israel would be opposed to it. I'd be interested to see the degree to which UN would be interested to help Israel rebuild the areas and the lives that have been shattered by Hamas rocket fire. Sir, Could, uh, can I ask you to speak, speak Chloe? The, the acoustics on this end are extremely <clears throat> difficult, and I'm picking up every third word. My name is Burton Bolag. I'm a freelance journalist. I spent many years living in Europe, in Switzerland, and former Czechoslovakia. Um, when, when one looks a, a little further at a kind of um, the, maybe the root causes of the conflict and what is a possible long-term solution, or, you know, um, to, to what extent is, uh, do you think Israel is interested in, in, a, um, in a two, is still interested in a two-state solution which would involve actually giving the West Bank and Gaza, well, the Gaza is already given back, giving the West Bank back to the Palestinians, and I mean evacuating the West Bank and not having it, you know, a 60 minutes set on Sunday, uh, just man who stands, cut up with lots of settlements, more and more settlements and fortified roads and so forth. Mm. Um, because I, I think for a lot of people, Certainly for some people, there, there is the, the, a feeling that part of Israel's aim now is to just inflict so much pain on, uh, on supporters of, uh, on people who support Hamas because Hamas, is, because it's clear that Hamas is holding out for that solution, whereas Fatah um, would accept the Bantustan solution. Kind of confused. Fatah's position is a, right now is a two-state solution. Uh, Hamas' position is not a two-state solution. It's a one-state solution, and that is an Islamic state, an Islamic state that begins in Palestine and ultimately encompasses the entire Middle East and beyond. It's, it's, it's a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. That is their position. Um, and the, I think your first question is a, is a very important question. To what degree are Israelis still interested in the two-state solution? One of the great revolutions of the last, oh, 15 years is that the Palestinian state, the creation of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, which was once viewed as an existential threat by the majority of Israelis, is now viewed by almost the same majority as the thing that's going to save the Jewish state. So it's, it's, it's a sea change, true revolution. And it's ironic slash tragic that at the very juncture when the majority of Israelis had come around to accepting this notion of a two-state solution, the chances for achieving that solution are increasingly dwindling. They are dwindling, first of all, on the Israeli side, not first of all, but on the Israeli side, uh, because creating a two-state solution would require the removal of between 80 and 120,000 Israelis from their homes. Now, remember I talked about the trauma of removing, removing 8,000 Israelis from their homes. And this is 8,000 Israelis not from the Gaza Strip, but from the biblical heartland of the West Bank, including Hebron, the second holiest city in Jerusalem, in, Israel, in Judaism. To do that, to, un to, take, to undertake that type of exquisitely painful, traumatic enterprise would require that same majority of Israelis to be utterly, utterly convinced that by doing that, they would get absolute peace. That it wouldn't be one or two rockets a week. That it wouldn't be the beginning of a next round of demands. That would be the end, the end of conflict, halas. And Convincing the Israeli population of that is extremely difficult right now, particularly since you have a Palestinian leadership which is divided between Hamas and, and al-Fatah, where you have a Palestinian leader, Mahmoud Abbas, who has actually now exceeded his term in office and doesn't really have, his question has of a questionable mandate. Um, extremely, extremely difficult. Um, 
I remain at the end of the day, and in this way I am not representative of the majority of Israelis, and I want you to know this, I'm not even the representative of my colleagues in my institute in Jerusalem, I'm the last of the standing unilateralists. And I believe that the only alternative Israel has to save itself as a Jewish state, and let's be frank about that the Jewish state is predicated on having a Jewish majority, the only way we can do that is by unilaterally withdrawing our border and withdrawing our settlements in the West Bank. And wishing the Palestinians luck, whatever, and hoping someday at a leadership that arises that is capable of ending the conflict. I personally don't see any alternative right now. I just don't. I see means of better managing the conflict, but solution, it's a word I tend to excise from my vocabulary when I'm talking about the Middle East, solutions, uh, I'm less sanguine. Hi, my name is Khalil. I um, just have two questions I kind of wanted to um, kind of go over with you. Um, you said in your, in your uh, address that Israel had the best intentions in mind of the Palestinian people in Gaza. And you said that the Israeli, the IDF dropped uh, leaflets and they sent SMS messages to phones. Um, my first question comes with that. How, how can Palestinians living in, in, in Gaza who are experiencing a blockade uh, where they have no electricity check their phones if the phones need to be charged. Mm. Um, I also heard that you said that during the most recent ceasefire that Hamas um, you know, would send rockets in to Israel uh, provoking an, some sort of attack on Gaza from Israel on November 4th. Um, my question on that is um, why then did the New York Times on November 5th of 2008 have a front page article um, whose title was Israel's strike is first in Gaza since start of ceasefire? Good question. Thank you. I'll, ask, I'll, I'll, I'll begin with the second one. I don't know why New York Times wrote that. It was the first Israeli ground operation in Gaza since the ceasefire. But it certainly wasn't the first strike per se, unless you're including Qassam rockets as strikes. All told, 70 rockets were fired from Gaza into Israel during the so-called ceasefire. Period. It's, it's, it's documented. If the New York Times wants to cons not consider a Qassam rocket falling in a neighborhood a strike, I suggest they move to that neighborhood. Maybe they change their mind. Um, as for the cell phones, many people in Gaza, particularly people who had cell phones, uh, had access to generators. Um, the, the text messages were sent off on a computer. They know they were received, thousands of them received, but most of the people got their messages from leaflets. The big problem, and here I think you're, you didn't quite touch on this point, but let me. There's a problem in Gaza Strip which, which it's not like Lebanon where you could leaflet and people could flee to Beirut. There's not a great many places you can flee to in Gaza. And many of these leaflets would direct uh, civilians to go to a certain area. But those areas became increasingly constricted as Israeli forces converged on population centers from all different uh, areas. And this raises a, a fundamental problem. How then can you fight in an ur urban combat environment in which civilians really can't leave at a certain point? I mean, they could up to a certain point, but really after you know, X number of days and fighting, not many places they can go. And um, frankly, I don't think there's a solution for it. I don't. I think you were almost on that point. Sure. Hello, my name is Dylan Carlin. I'm the president of the Jewish Students of Oakton in Oakton High School. And this recent conflict has sapped my hope of um, a solution and alienated me from many of my uh, Oriental friends. Do you, as a historian, believe that peace, not simply an absence of conflict, but at true reconciliation between not simply Israel and the Palestinians, but Israel and the Arab world and the West and the Islamic world is possible in the near future? Okay. Again, I, 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 that, when I hear the solution word, I tend to bristle because um, there are not many solutions for many Middle Eastern conflicts, not just the solution between ourselves and, and the Palestinians, ourselves and the Arabs, or between ourselves and Muslims, including the Iranians. Uh, very, very complex issues. And there are ways toward um, better managing the conflict, to relieving uh, tensions to ensuring against uh, future flare-ups, to increasing, to ameliorating the conditions under which peoples live. All of these. Uh, peace, a solution, if you will, is not a question of next week, 
week after. It's a generational issue. It's going to have to involve, it's going to have to be built from the bottom up. One of the lessons we've learned from the failed Oslo process is that you cannot impose peace from the top down. It has to be built up with institutions and the construction